This week on Inside the Headset, we are featuring Dave Clawson, the head football coach at Wake Forest. Coach Clawson reflects on his start in the profession, his reputation as a program builder, and offers some advice to young coaches. If you like this podcast, make sure to follow us wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel to watch new episodes each week. Now, let's get Inside the Headset with Coach Clawson. Lawson, thanks so much for joining us. How are you doing? I'm doing great. It's the uh, first time I've been in the AFCA offices, and yeah. it's a really impressive place. <laughs> no doubt, no doubt. Well, I appreciate you dropping by the offices. Uh, definitely excited about, about having you and the board here around us, and uh, I'm really excited about hopping into this podcast. I uh, had the opportunity to just go check out your bio. Man, it's uh interesting, interesting, interesting start. So I'm going to go ahead and dive in real quick. Uh I, I know everybody's definitely been in, uh, intrigued with the long mesh and all the cool stuff you guys are doing offensively, and I know everybody knows you as an offensive guy, but I didn't know until I started digging in that you played defensive back in, out of uh, in college, in high school, and uh, actually started off as a defensive back coach. Uh, just really quick, just take it way back, and we're going to kind of start way back to your plan days and when you decided that you wanted to be a ball coach. So I was, I was a high school quarterback and, um, you know, I wanted to be a power five player and sent out all those videotapes and got a lot of rejections and then <laughs> wanted to be an FCS player, one double A at the time and sent out a bunch of videotapes and got a lot of rejections. Yeah. And, uh, so I, I had an opportunity to go to a place called Williams college in Northwest Massachusetts and play football and basketball there. And I was recruited as a quarterback. And the first day of practice, I threw three passes. And the next day, they had me backpedaling. So, <laughs> and then my, my sophomore year, three of the four of us who started in the secondary yeah. were recruited there as quarterbacks. So, their philosophy, and this was in the mid 80s, is let's recruit quarterbacks who are usually the best athletes on the high school team. Right. And then this becomes the secondary, the receivers, the tight ends, even the linebackers. And uh, I ended up playing positionally for a guy named Dick Farley, who was the defensive coordinator and secondary coach at Williams, who then became the head coach, and he's now in the College Football Hall of Fame. So uh, Dick uh, was and remains, you know, one of my probably primary mentors of getting into coaching. Yeah, that's all. That's awesome that uh, that they had that philosophy and that that thought to take quarterbacks usually, I mean, you mentioned that the athleticism high IQ as well, just been able to take a lot of information in. So that, that's awesome. That's that, that was your start to it. Now, uh, as we dive into coaching, your first actual coaching position was there at uh, Albany. Um, and you were the, uh, you were defensive backs guy there for your first job. Is that correct? Well, I, I got hired at the University of Albany, and uh, I worked for a legendary coach there, Bob Ford, Bob Ford yep. who at the time in the Northeast, they had a GA program, and they would hire about seven or eight GAs a year, and they didn't have a lot of full-time coaches, but he, he put out so many coaches, guys like, you know, Davey Campo, who was, became the head coach of the Cowboys, and Al Bagnoli, who had a great run at Union College in Penn and who now, who's now at Columbia. And there was this whole network of guys that GA'd at Albany. And I went there and, and again, I learned from one of the masters that he was, uh, you know, very uh, moral. Um, he, he really took pride in developing coaches and coaching coaches. And a matter of fact, on my drive down from Dallas to Waco yesterday, uh, I gave him a call and I was reflecting on coming down here and how my journey in this profession started and called him and, and thanked him for giving me an opportunity to become a college football coach. Oh, wow. That's awesome. That, that, that's awesome that, uh, that, that you're still connected with him like that. And, uh, interestingly enough, we had, uh, coach Fagiano from Utica he, and he was another one of those Albany graduate assistants. I, I remember ca calling your name. I was at long list of just coaches that came in GA there and have went on to do some extraordinary things. Now, I think I misstated earlier. You, you started as a QB RB guy. My first year there, I was like, they, they, we had a JV program. Okay. And so when you first got there, uh, your first year, you were an assistant to the varsity coach. Okay. And then if you did a good job, your second year, you got a varsity position. So my first year I coached quarterbacks and running backs in a wishbone offense. Oh, wow. So it was the true wishbone. Yeah. Um, 
And then that next year, uh, because I had played secondary in college, I had an opportunity to be the, uh, the varsity secondary coach and had the, the safeties in the corners. And then that led to my first full-time job at the University of Buffalo, working for a guy named Sam Sanders, uh, who hired me as the secondary coach at Buffalo in, in 1991. And, and there you switch back to QB and, and RB at some point in time, right? Yeah, well, Sam um, unfortunately got sick. Okay. And uh, the head coach they hired was a guy named Jim Ward, who uh, had run the, uh, you know, the old midline uh, trap option series. Mm-hmm. And uh, because I had coached quarterbacks in an option offense, he then moved me back to quarterbacks and running backs. And, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a good staff. And I ended up working with Jeff Monken, who's now the head coach at Army. Jeff was the uh, receivers coach. And uh, a guy named Brian Wilson, who ended up being a really good high school coach in Western New York, was the offensive coordinator. And uh, had a good year, uh, you know, scored some points. And then pretty much the whole staff got fired after that year. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, uh, yeah, I, I'm trying to you know, take yourself back to being that, that young coach when you're pretty much back and forth on either side of the ball all the way from a senior in high school. Did you, did you fall in love with any position? Or, you know, as you were making these transitions, did it really matter to you at that point? Well, I think when you first start in the profession, right, you just – Hey, First goal is to get a job. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You know, if you yeah. can, if back then, if you could get a job with benefits, yeah. you felt you were doing pretty well. And, you know, you, you take the opportunities you have and you make the most of them. And then after the 92 season, you know, most of the assistant coaches got let go. Mm-hmm. And I had the hardest time finding a job. So next time my resume is I, I waited tables in Columbus, Ohio at the Cooker Bar and Grill. <laughs> I think I made a dollar eighteen an hour plus tips. And I would take every double shift I could yeah. for two or three weeks. And then I would just travel and go visit with football coaches in clinic and try to learn football. And uh, I could not find a job. And the only job I could end up getting hired for was as the running back coach at Lehigh. And I think I got paid maybe $3,000 or $3,500 for the year but I worked for a guy named Hank Small. And at the time, Hank was a, a real innovator. We were running one back and spread concepts. And he was one of the few people doing that and throwing the ball. And there was a lot of West Coast principles in his offense. But I, I kind of was learning that to really, if you're going to get ahead in the profession, you, you got to learn a system yeah, and become immersed in that system. And uh, I had that opportunity with Hank. And then we won the championship at Lehigh in 93. Hank resigned. Kevin Higgins, who was the defensive coordinator, got promoted to head coach. And fortunately, Kevin saw something in me and gave me a chance to be the offensive coordinator. So I went from unemployed make it, to making $3,000 a year to become the offensive coordinator at Lehigh all within one calendar year. Yeah, that that that's insane. And, uh, you know, uh, before, before we got on this podcast, we, I was, I was kind of asking about that transition how that went down and you know oftentimes you hear about how so much about impressing your your head coach when you're when you're working for him all that kind of stuff but clearly you were doing something that was as a running back coach to be impressing your defensive coordinator when when you know if you could reflect back I know this is what 90 93 94 uh do, do you recall that conversation you know what when he called you in there to say hey, I want you to be my offensive coordinator what how did that go well he was interviewing for the head job and he had to present a staff and and at the time I, I had another opportunity to go somewhere else as a receiver coach. And the AD met with me, a guy named Joe Starrett, who is still the athletic director at Lehigh and someone I'm still in touch with and really respect. And he said, Hey, I'm not sure what's going to happen here, but we value you. And no matter who the head coach is, you'll have a position here. And at that point I, it was a pretty good chance that Kevin was going to get the job. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think there was a, another coach with a little more experience than me that Kevin was trying to get as the coordinator, but he wanted to keep the same system. Yeah. And I just said, I'd love to sit down with you and kind of give you my vision for the offense if you get the job. And obviously that went well. And he came out of it and said, well, if I get this job, you'll be my coordinator. And again, Kevin is another great mentor to this day. Now, Kevin is on my staff at Wake Forest and he's been with me for 10 years and that's been one of those lifetime uh, relationships uh, that I think is unique to coaching is yeah. that you spend so much time and so many hours 
with people and you just build bonds and relationships and a trust that I don't know if people in other professions really get to experience. And, you know, Kevin is really became a mentor to me and a dear friend and someone to this day that we still work together and I'm still really close with. Man, that that's crazy how all this stuff is kind of all coming full circle, <laughs> you know. Uh, now, as far as as far as your time being on offense, um, you know, you were the running backs coach that one year, and then obviously you felt confident enough to go sit down and say, "Hey, I love to talk to you about this position that that you have." You know, at that point, were you tinkering? Were you changing things? Were you showing maybe some stuff that you would like to see in that offense, or were you kind of re, you know, regurgitating what you guys had did that year? I think more than anything. Um, that Kevin Lehigh had had a lot of success on offense yeah. and a lot of the players were back and it wasn't broken. So let's not fix it. Right. And yeah. here's a guy that's been in those meetings for a year that knows what we do. And then clearly we had a new head coach. And I also knew that coming from the defensive side of the ball, that Kevin would want to run the ball more than we ran it. Mm. And to make sure that we had uh, ideas and thoughts and ways of integrating maybe a little bit more of a physical style of running game while keeping a lot of the past concepts we had. Yeah. And that was kind of what I was charged with. And then we hired a guy named Andy Cohen uh, as the offensive line coach. And Andy uh, just passed away a year ago and he had a really, really successful run at Lehigh and in, as the head coach. And it was just a, it was a really special time that, you know, Kevin was kind of learning to be a head coach. I was learning to be a coordinator. Andy Cohen was a great addition. And uh, we, we had a lot of success and a lot of good people. Yeah. I, I One thing I loved about, you know, when I, when I was still in the profession was just like uh, the pace at which it went. You know, it was like you said, that one year you went from waiting tables to calling plays, you know, and, and less than our calendar year. Um, you know, when you're when you got that promotion and, 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 and you're – preparing for opponents did you ever stop and smell the roses and just be like man i'm doing this and also on the flip side of that did you have any moments where you felt like you were ill prepared you know just with the lack of experience at that point in time yeah I th <laughs> that's, that's <laughs> you know I, I i wanted the job and the second he gave it to me and said it's yours i'm like okay <laughs> i'm not really sure i'm ready to do this <laughs> so i think it's like anytime you get a new job or a new responsibility yeah. when you get it at that moment you're not ready for it right but then you just work like crazy and you get on that treadmill and you run as fast as you can. Right. Uh, and I think in some ways, sometimes you do your best job then. Yeah. Oh, right? When you don't, yeah. you, you detail every moment and every play and every script and you're, you're very self-aware of your lack of experience. And so you have to make up for your lack of experience with an overabundance of preparation. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and that was kind of what I learned to do. And, um, you know, I still made a bunch of mistakes. I remember the first game, you know, it was like a third and seven or third and eight in the red zone. And, you know, I kind of ran a, an inside dive play. <laughs> and Kevin looked at me and said, did you mean to run that? And, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I looked back and I didn't even realize it was third down. Oh, my goodness. You know, yeah. so you make those, you know, unfortunately, I was able to, to make those mistakes right. and hopefully not hurt our football team too much. And we ended up still winning that game, but that was a mistake I never made again. Absolutely. And that's sometimes the best way to learn. Yeah. <laughs> and, and at this time you were 27, 28 years old, somewhere around there. I was 27 years old and I was uh, an offensive coordinator at a, a good school in a good place, working for a great head coach. And, you know, fortunately we had enough good players that overcame my lack of, uh, <laughs> knowledge and experience. Yeah. Um, but we had, we had good players and there was a system in place and I was definitely the beneficiary of what Hank small established. Right. And again, sometimes when you have good players, it can overcome coaching. <laughs> hey, that's right. Now, uh, that, that, that was 94, 95 and Andy Talley, who was a great friend of the AFCA. Um, and then love what he's absolutely, absolutely love what he's doing with the bone marrow deal now. Um, you, you got the opportunity to go over to be the offensive coordinator there from 96 to 98. Um, obviously, you know, especially as you kind of, you kind of poke fun at the, your first year and some of the mistakes you made, you obviously grew a ton over those years. Uh, what was that transition like to get to Villanova, you know, uh, link up with Andy Talley uh, and, and grow there? Did you bring over your offense? You know, how did you get the job? All that kind of stuff just circling around that. Well, it's, again, it's a small world. So Villanova is just, you know, an hour or so down the road from Lehigh. Okay. 
And uh, one of Andy Talley's really good friends was the head coach at Lafayette at the time, Bill Russo. And I think Bill recommended me to Andy in part to help Andy and in part to get me out of Lehigh. <laughs> and uh, there was two finalists for that job, the offense coordinator at uh, Villanova. It was myself and Mike Leach. And Mike at the time was the offensive coordinator for Hal Mummy at uh, Valdosta State. Okay. And, and I probably got the job just because of where I was coming from and I was more familiar with yeah. Pennsylvania and the recruiting area at Villanova and all that stuff. And uh, so I always used to joke with Mike Leach that I made his career because if, <laughs> if I hadn't got this job, he might have not ended up at Kentucky and Oklahoma. And, uh, but, but anyways, a, a chance to work for Andy and, and really a chance to coach scholarship football. At the time, Lehigh was non-scholarship financial aid. Uh, Villanova was in the old Yankee Conference. And there were some legendary coaches back then, you know, Tubby Raymond at Delaware, Bill Bowles at New Hampshire. Uh, it was really good football. Right. And it was an opportunity now to install the offense that, you know, I learned some different things that had been my third year as a coordinator and to now install it, to teach the staff, to then teach the players, which was a, a really valuable experience. I'm making that transition, you know, I, going to have a, a couple of themes here where I ask you about, you know, the first times and, and, you know, now it's your first time actually doing that, that process of it, the ins installation scholarship athletes, uh, you know, did, did that first time, was that trip a little smoother? You know, now that, now that you've been, you've had the experience from Lehigh, you know, did that transition go a lot smoother? It did just because we had had two pretty successful years at Lehigh as a program and offensively. Mm -hmm. And I probably had a confidence level now doing it that I didn't have when I first became the coordinator at Lehigh. Right. So, um, you know, we had had success and, you know, I was probably a little too brash, right? I think when you're a young coach uh, and you have success, there's a tendency to think it's because of your brilliance or design. And the older you get, you realize how little right. <laughs> that had to do with it. Um, but at Villanova, we had some really good coaches there. Mark Ferrante, that was the O-line coach, is now the head coach at Villanova. Sam Venuto was our receiver coach, who was a brilliant, excellent football coach in his own right. Stan Drayton, the head coach at Temple, was our running backs coach. And, and we had a strong staff. And uh, we had a really good three-year run there. And, again, we had good players. You know, yeah. Brian Finner and Brian Westbrook, Chris Bowden, uh, there's a lot of bad plays I called that went for, <laughs> for 30 and 40 yards with that group. Yeah. Yeah. You get a good group back there and it makes, it makes you look like a genius. Uh, yeah. And I, I tell you what, when I always get so intrigued when I do these podcasts, especially with the head coaches and cause they've been on more staff than some of the other guys. And, and I mean, just the tree of Andy Talley is amazing. And, 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 and uh, Albany graduate assistant deal, like I just learned about that. So, uh, been around some great guys. So Go do a good job there at Villanova. Uh, how did the Fordham thing come about? At this point in time, now you're you know, 33, I would imagine, 32, something like that, still relatively young from a, from, from a coaching standpoint, but you're starting to get some experience under your belt. Just, just the process of you seeing the Fordham job come open, how did everything circle you getting your first head job? Well, 97 at Villanova, we had a really good season. I mean, we, we were loaded on offense to this day even spending now going into my 10th, 11th year at a power five program, that Villanova offense in 97 might've been as talented as any group I've ever had. I mean, right. Brian Westbrook was our tailback, Brian Fennerin, who had a 14 year career in the NFL, uh, Chris Bowden, who had a long career uh, playing arena football. I mean, we probably had six or seven pros on that offense, you know, in, the Yankee conference, which right. became the Atlantic 10. Um, so I was approached uh, to be by Frank McLaughlin, the athletic director at Fordham after the 97 season. Um, and at that point I was going to have to keep the staff and I wasn't quite sure if I was ready for that job. And I was really happy at Villanova and, and I, I didn't turn the job down, but I turned down a, a chance to interview for it. And they ended up hiring Ken O'Keefe. And then Ken went there, and a year later, he joined um, the staff at Iowa with Kirk Ferentz. Okay. And so I kind of turned down the opportunity to interview for the job in 97. And then in 98, the job reopened. 
and this time I could bring my own staff. Okay. And so I, I took the job in December of 98. I was 31 years old. I think at the time I was the youngest division one head coach in the country. And in no way was I ready for that job. It was, you know, I, I learned the hard way of all the things I didn't realize that went on behind the scenes at the other places that we had scored points. Yeah. It's a, a much different job. Uh, you know, thinking globally about the whole program recruiting, um, you know, it, it was a hard transition. And, you know, sometimes I would like to go back to that 1999 Fordham team and apologize to them yeah. for my, you know, some of the things that I, I, I did do and didn't do, I, I could have done a much better job. Yeah, well, I, I mean, you must have read my mind because I the question I kind of want to go over around this was, you know, it was an 11 season. Um, the the self reflection that happens after a first year head coach. I mean, like it, much like the offensive coordinator deal, I'm sure you made mistakes that most first first year head coaches that make. But you know, uh, putting your staff together, you know, how you schedule things and all that kind of stuff. What kind of self reflection and what did you do, you know, to improve yourself? after that first year? Well, when you go in 11, right, there's nobody in the office that can say, Hey, I did my job. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, I, I didn't fire anybody. I didn't let any coaches go and just said, listen, we've got to really examine everything we do. And, and I realized then that a lot of the mistakes that I had made at other places were covered up by the talent. Yeah. And when you're in 11, you know, there's a resounding thump that, you got to look at everything you're doing from your weight program to how you're meeting, to how you're practicing, to how you're teaching the inside zone play or the lead draw. Yeah. And that same year, uh, coach Lou Holtz was at South Carolina and they went on 11. Mm -hmm. And so in some ways like, Hey, a, a coach as great as Lou Holtz. Yeah. Right. And, and what I did is I, I had coaches reach out to the South Carolina staff of what were they going to do? Mm -hmm that next year, that off season. And it was just a matter of making everything competitive. I think we had to build better relationships and trust with our players off the field, but we had to create a much more competitive environment on the field. Right. And uh, I, I think we did that. I think we took some necessary steps of, of simplifying what we did on both sides of the football. We were doing way too much. Um, our defensive coordinator at the time, Dave Cohen, who GA'd with me at Albany had come from Delaware and he had come from Delaware and they had won a lot of games. Yeah. And I came from Villanova and we won a lot of games, but the systems over years had built up to be much more multiple and we had to scale down and keep it simple. Mm -hmm. And uh, the next year we got better. Uh, we won three games, but we were much more competitive. And then finally in, you know, 2001, we started turning the corner. Yeah. Well, you said some, uh, I really like, you know, about some of the mistakes that you made early on and, and figuring things out that, that, that pressure kind of, kind of, kind of made you better because you were so prepared. Um, after a season like that, I can only imagine I've, I've been on the one in one in 12 team before, and it was it, how difficult it was just to turn through each week. Um, in hindsight, if you don't have that year, do you, do you, do you think you, do you think you have the career that you have? You know, it w was that, was that a, you know, obviously a negative moment at, at the time, but was it a positive moment in the grand scheme of things of how you did things going forward? Absolutely. There was a lot of silver linings, I think. Yeah. Um, and, and the biggest thing was just, you know, the old adage, right? The players don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Yeah. You know, and, and I really believe because of the success we had at Lehigh and Villanova that, you know, it was in the scheme and the teaching and the play calling. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. Um, and we just invested a lot more time with the players. Uh, I think we built better bonds with them. I think we became a staff uh, that instead of them resenting us, they wanted to play for. Um, and I think all those little things make you a better coach. And it's really why you should get into coaching, Absolutely. right? If you yeah. truly care about the players and their development. And uh, I knew that, but there's no question that first year, I, I lost sight of the big picture. And I think that next year we kind of refocused our motivation on helping players get better, investing in them as people and, uh, and then doing a better job with our meetings, preparation, installation, all that stuff. Right. Well, before I go to the next question, cause it kind of ties into this. I, I, I whenever I talk about it first, uh, 
a coach's first year as a head coach. I always want to ask, uh, and this is probably more my personal interest than maybe others, but uh, how, how, what was the thought process putting your staff together? Was it just guys that you knew? Did, did you hire anybody that you didn't know? Um, just that first staff that you hired? Well, it's a little bit of a combination, right? You want to hire guys you know. Um, and, and sometimes you can hire guys you're too friendly with. You know, when you hire friends, uh, there's always that balance of some of them are going to work so hard to make you successful because you are their friend and others maybe feel they can cut corners and not have to do things and they take advantage of the friendship. Yeah. Um, but it was really a combination of you want people who know you, you want people who know the institution, and you also need people that have a skill set and a recruiting expertise that you need to build your team. So it's, it's almost like a third, a third, a third familiarity with the head coach, familiarity with the area and the institution, mm -hmm. and then the skill sets you need to round out your staff, whether it be positional knowledge, right. recruiting a certain area that you have to hit. Yeah. Did you uh, retain anybody from the previous staff? I know it was, a, I did. You you did. Know, okay. Yeah. I, I, I retained uh, two coaches from the previous staff. Okay. And th these are guys that I had known before or gotcha. guys that, to me, when I met with them, uh, brought value and would fit in with our staff philosophically. And sometimes those hires work out and sometimes they don't. Absolutely. I mean, generally speaking, when I've retained coaches, it's probably 50, 50 that, uh, you know, some of them are agreeable and want to stay just cause they want to make sure they have a job. And then right. the second they know they have a job, they start looking for other jobs. And sometimes some of the very best coaches I've had are guys that I've retained and hired. I mean, when I got to Bowling Green, I retained the running back coach, John Hunter. And John has been one of the most valuable members of our staff now for 15 straight years at Bowling Green. And now he's been with me all 10 years at Wake Forest. And I mean, he is just an outstanding coach person, one of the best hires I've ever made in my career. And that was one that I inherited and retained and thank God I did it. Yeah, that's I, I love to hear those stories as well. Um, now, you know, kind of getting back, obviously that first year, I mean, I, just hearing you talk about it, I can, I can tell how much that probably impacted your career moving forward. Uh, but you kind of set a trend, it seemed like. All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this real quick, so pardon me for, for looking down. Uh, 1999, Fordham, you start off 0-11. Uh, you walk out 2003, 9-3 in the conference champions in 2002. Uh, 2004, you get hired at Richmond, start out 3-8, and eight, and then uh, walk out of there uh, four years later, 2007, 11 and three conference champions. Uh, Bowling Green, you inherit, uh, excuse me, you, your first year is uh, 2006. You're seven and six. Now, this is kind of a unique deal here. You were seven and six, uh, but two and 10 the next year. And I, I'll let you kind of explain some issues on, on, on that deal. But uh, but you walk out of there 10 and three in uh, uh, conference champions once again. And you get Wake Forest in 2014, and I can attest to this because I was on the staff at ULM, and uh, our season opener was against Wake Forest. I was joking with Coach here about this before we got started, and we opened up against Wake Forest, and we were probably middle of the pack uh, Sun Belt team, and uh, it went down to the wire, and not very beautifully with Wake Forest in your first first game as the head coach there. And uh, obviously, you know, you know what you've done there is, is speaking for itself at, at the very least 20, 2022 eight and five, 11 and three the year prior and conference champion. So uh, you, you kind of have, 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 like I said, at, at Fordham kind of set this routine up of, you know, maybe starting off uh, or inheriting a program that's not in a great place and just getting that thing going within three to four years. Uh, now every school, all, all 40 schools, I'm sure are just so drastically different in many ways. Uh, some scholarships, some non-scholarship. I, I, I know some of those schools were in the, the Patriot League, right? Or may, maybe not when you were there, I'm sorry. Uh, but I, I know some of the schools are very much different. Um, what were some of the commonalities that that you that you go and find to be able to kind of have this I don't know, very similar pattern at, at all these different universities? I think part of it is you just you got to bring the same value system to every program. Like there's certain things that we do at every place, and I say we because it's not one person; it's a culture mm -hmm. that are non-negotiables. You know, we want guys that love football. We want guys that are going to go to class. We want guys that are going to do the right things off the field. And I think there's a, a value system that helps establish a culture that's non-negotiable. Yeah. Now, every school, these places are completely different. Absolutely. Fordham is 
uh, a Jesuit school in the middle of the Bronx. Um, Richmond is a kind of a suburban high academic school, uh, you know, in a, a kind of a wealthy suburban area. Uh, Bowling Green is a, a te- was founded as a teacher's college in the cornfields of Northwest Ohio and uh, in Wake Forest, obviously, is in the ACC. Um, and so what I've found is we're very uh, strict and non-negotiable on the value system, but everything else has to be flexible. I mean, uh, we've run four different offensive systems. We've run all different defensive systems. We've had different special teams. Uh, we've gone from, you know, Fordham was a national recruiting model that we were in Catholic schools in Ohio and Florida and California, Richmond was more regional, you know, Bowling Green was almost all Midwest and major Ohio, Michigan, and then Wake Forest because of the nature of the school were a little bit more national there. And so I think you have to identify the institution and say, what are the institutional strengths? Who are the students that pick the school? Forget the football players. Mm. And then you play to your strengths and and you've got to get out of the habit of saying, okay, these are our obstacles. No, what are your strengths? What are the like, okay, imagine that you're winning championships in five years or 10 years. When you go back, you're going to say, this is why we won. These are the advantages we have and play to your strengths. And you took the job. There's no point in saying we don't, we're not this, we're not that. Okay. What are we? And, and let's live in that reality. How, how quickly are you able to kind of identify those strengths and, and even the difficulties or obstacles? It, t- it takes, I, I think, you know, usually a, a year to 18 months. Okay. You, you go through one cycle and in some ways that you predicted correctly and in some ways you didn't. Right. That sometimes you think you're going to be able to recruit a certain way and sell this and you find out, well, geez, no, actually, this is more of a strength. Yeah. Once you learn the institution, um, once you win some recruiting battles and lose some recruiting battles, you figure out why you won them, why you lost them. And, and it's really, you know, you have to make the decision of, okay, where are you going to apply your resources? You only have so many coaches. There's only so many things you can do. You know, it's time spent, value received, and, and figuring that out as soon as you can. Absolutely. Well, you know, when I was going through the records there, I, I, I pinpointed uh bowling green seven and six start and then two and ten the next year which kind of breaks the trend of everywhere else and, you, and i know there was a unique situation there with kind of apr i'm gonna let you explain that um and and really talk about you know i, I don't know if many people are familiar with what coach is gonna talk about here but uh sometimes some, you, you end up with some scholarship issues when when you have 85 and you know you have apr hits and things like that like coach is going to talk about here in a second but uh you know kansas went through that at uh uh, not very long ago, I think when Les, Coach Les Miles was the head coach, they were kind of dealing with some of that stuff. Uh, right now, even with this transfer portal thing, a lot of depleted rosters. How did you dig yourself out of that as well as you kind of tell the story? Well, it took time. When I when I got the job, I mean, part of the reason I got the job is they had had some off the field issues there. They had had some discipline issues and academic issues, and the APR was at a level that we were going to lose eleven scholarships, and so we were short. I think eleven. Um, and it was going to go into effect the next year. And then that first year, I think we had 22 or 23 seniors. And so back then there was a signing limit of 25 players. So you take over and there's, you know, 80 scholarship guys in the program. You're going to be short 11 and you graduate 22 players. So I I think the second year, you know, we might've had 58 scholarship players and then you can't afford to lose anybody because then you really can't replace them. So it, it took us probably two or three years before we were even back to 85. And Bowling Green's a great job. It's a great place. You know, there's a good tradition there going back to Dwight Perry and Don Nealon and Gary Blackney and Urban Meyer. And, and they've had some really good coaches there. It's a place you can win. We just were shorthanded once we lost all those seniors who were good players, yeah. we got to a bowl with those guys. Um, but when they graduated, we were young and we were shorthanded. And I probably made it worse by still choosing the red shirt guys. Yeah, I uh, just just to chime in at the, the, I would have never guessed that happened. I, obviously I didn't know that happened, 
but you know, uh, going back to playing you guys in, in in 2014 at Wake Forest, obviously it's the first game of the year, so we're watching a bunch of Bowling Green film, and I mean that Bowling Green roster looked more talented than you and, and, and Wake Forest. I mean, oh, it, it was. We yeah. had some great players on that that Bowling Green 2013 team, and yeah. You know, one of the great things about coaching is in a week and a half, that team is getting together for a reunion. Oh, wow. So I haven't seen those guys in 10 years. But, yeah, we we ended up having a really good couple of years at Bowling Green at the yeah. end. I think in 2012 we won uh, eight games. And then uh, 2013 we, we won the MAC title and won 10 games. And, again, the longer you're in this, you know, you know the reason for your success is it's, it's hard to win games without good players. And, we were very talented. We had a great quarterback, a bunch of good receivers, an NFL tight end, some really good guys on defense, and we ended up beating a Northern Illinois team that I think was ranked 12 in the country. And if they won that game, they were going to go to the Fiesta Bowl. And I remember getting the MAC championship trophy, and the commissioner of the MAC was not very happy with oh us because the school, the league was going to get like $8 million by oh sending the team to the Fiesta Bowl. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, uh, you know, he, he smiled, but you could tell deep right. down, I don't think there were too many schools in the conference uh, rooting for the Falcons that night. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm, 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 ex I'm happy that happened for you. And uh, man, this, this, this has been amazing. Now, uh, real quick, as we kind of start coming to a close here, coach, uh, I appreciate you taking me down that, that journey of your, of your career. Um, now, as you look back at it, these young, uh, young coaches who are just entering the profession, high school guys, maybe want to make the transition to college, lower level guys, like you started off at, uh, now what kind of words of encouragement would you give them? Just, just, just as they navigate this coaching profession. Well, it's the profession has changed a lot. When I got into coaching in the late 1980s, you know, coaches didn't make money. You know, you got into coaching for the, to be part of a team and to work with young people and um, hopefully instill values in a work ethic and, and all those intangible qualities. And then the, the profession has changed right now. It's become a more of a business. Um, and, and so you just hope that the people who get into it are still getting into it for the right reasons. And then I, I, I really believe that, you know, when you're, you're climbing the ladder and you're a young coach, who you work for and who you work with is more important than where you work or how much you make. That if you surround yourself with good people and you do things right, you know, good people, good coaches, those are the ones that are going to climb and they take the good people with them. That's right. And so, you know, I think so many times now people are work at places, you know, cause it pays this amount and, you know, part of what makes a job good is, is what it pays. But early in your career, if you can be with good people um, and, you know, learn, get good at something. You know, I, I once had a, a young coach, and he's now an NFL defensive coordinator, that he was on my staff uh, at two different places. And he was always looking for different jobs and trying to get this and trying to get that. And you know, I, I was getting a little bit irritated. Like, are you with me or not? Yeah. And I go, my advice is, is the best way to climb the ladder is why don't you get good at something first? Like yeah. become the very best D-line coach, become the very, you know, invest in yourself and create value for yourself. And when you do that, people, you don't not going to have to look for jobs. People will look for you. That's right. And, uh, you know, at the time, I don't think he appreciated it. And then 10 years later, he told me, that he never forgot it and he appreciated it. And he believes it's one of the reasons he got ahead and he's doing a super job now. And he's an NFL defensive coordinator and he's very respected. Um, but I really think, you know, get good at something. Don't just look to climb before you're ready. Yeah. And if you're with good people, they're always going to bring good people with them. Well, everybody listening, uh, that, that's, that's the gym that you can take with you. I appreciate you sharing that coach. And last thing before I let you go here, um, you were named to the AFC Board of Trustees in January of last year. Uh, just from your point of view, why why was it important for you to become involved with the AFCA, especially to this capacity? Well, first off, I, when uh, you know our executive director Todd Barry asked me to join, I was flattered. You know, you grow up in the profession, going to conventions, and you know, from the time Grant Taft, and you know, to me, this is you know th this represents the values and the best of the the professional or you know the coaching profession. Yeah. And, uh, 
you know, when you get asked to join an organization like this at the board level, you, you, you don't say no. And it was a great honor. Uh, but I also think a, a lot has changed about coaching college football. And uh, to me, the AFCA is always looking out for the best of the game, the best for the coaches, the best for the players, and not just the almighty dollar. Right. And I just, I, I love to be associated with a group um, in an organization that I really believe has the best interest of football uh, as its sole purpose and its decision-making. So, um, you know, it's certainly one of my career highlights is being asked to join the board uh, at the AFCA. Absolutely. Well, we're excited about having you and uh, appreciate what you do, not just for the profession, but for your young people and all the, all the staffs and uh, uh, teams that you've been on. Uh, and thanks so much for, for coming down to Waco and joining me. Thanks so much for having me and go Deeks. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Inside the Headset. If you heard anything on this episode that you would like to learn more information about, head over to afcapodcast.com where you can find every episode and all of the corresponding show notes. While you're there, take a second to rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions for the show, please let us know by sending an email to podcast at afca.com. Make sure to follow the podcast on Twitter at Inside the Headset and tag it when you share each episode. You can stay up to date with all things AFCA by following the at We Are AFCA Twitter account. Every episode of Inside the Headset can also be found on your favorite audio streaming platforms such as Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube. If you are not currently a member of the AFCA, be sure to find us online at AFCA.com and apply to join over 10,000 NFL, college, and high school coaches from around the country who are striving to be the best they can be. With an AFCA membership, you gain invaluable access to the annual AFCA convention, the bi-monthly magazine, and the new and improved digital library, which contains thousands of videos and articles contributed by hundreds of current and former football coaches. You can also visit AFCAinsider.com to sign up for our free weekly email newsletter on the right-hand side of the screen. It comes out every Tuesday at lunch and is filled with great articles and stories written by many of the same coaches you hear on the podcast. It's geared to help you become a better coach tomorrow than you are today. Be sure to connect with me on Twitter at Coach Mario Price. And remember, the AFCA is not just an annual convention. It is an association that continually promotes education, guidance, and networking. But it is also so much more than that. The AFCA is about celebrating the past and educating the future. It is about developing great coaches who will produce great teams and even better people. So invest in your skill set and impact today by engaging with the AFCA.